I'm in a lot of leagues, but I'll tell you, as much as I try to diversify, there are some pitchers I just find myself drafting over and over again. So I want to share them with you. These are the starting pitchers I can't get enough of. If you can't wait for draft season, guess what? You don't have to. Join Underdog Fantasy and you can draft right now for MLB Best Ball for the 2024 season. They've got some new contests that just opened up. Check them out right now. If you sign up and use promo code ENDGAME, you get a 100% deposit match for your first $100 that you put into your account. Try Underdog Fantasy today. Why not start with a pitcher who is the ace of the Dodgers and not only favorite for rookie of the year, but might be a Cy Young candidate in his rookie season, Yoshinobu Yamamoto. On the one hand, it's easy to just jump all over this pick because of the massive contract he was given, the fact that he is on the Dodgers, the high profile and all that. And at the same time, it's easy to be scared away by all that because we've never seen him pitch a regular season game in the major leagues. Is there going to be an acclimation period? Is the pressure going to be too much? Is he going to hold up for the full season? All of those questions. And sure, ultimately, we don't really know until we see what happens. But I'm not scared of this pick because... I'll tell you what, a lot of people are just hesitant because it's like an unknown entity here, but he's not unknown. We've seen him pitch, well, maybe not in person, but we know that he's pitched for several years overseas. Yeah, it's a different league, slightly different, but it's not a different sport. This guy has been successful for years. He has filthy stuff. There's a reason that the Dodgers, not a dumb franchise, decided to pay so much for so long. Last year, nobody was really on Kodai Senga because of all those concerns. And look what happened. He wanted to be one of the better starting pitchers in the majors. And Yamamoto is not even arguably better of a pitcher. I've really come around on this pick because, you know, I try to follow a lot of smart people who know a lot more about baseball than I do. One of them is Lance Brozdowski. His specialty is breaking down pitching and starting pitchers and their stuff. There's a lot more to it, but basically, let's just say that he showed that Yamamoto's pitch mix is something that major league hitters just might not be ready for, especially his hard splitters. I have no doubt he'll be elite when it comes to punching batters out. Wins definitely not going to be an issue there in L.A. I think he can hold up over the course of a season, so why wouldn't he be one of the top starting pitchers? His ADP actually isn't that low right now, and so to get him, you're going to have to pay third, fourth round price at the very least, but I think it's worth it. And you want to talk about putting my money where my mouth is, literally. I just finished a very competitive 20-team auction league with a salary budget of $150. I paid $23 just to get Yamamoto as my ace. That's 15% of my total budget. That's how sure I am of him. All right, my next one, if you've watched any of my videos from this preseason or even last season, you know I've been all over Grayson Rodriguez for a while, even before he went off in the second half of 2023. He was one of my favorite preseason picks from last year, and it was looking like a pretty bad pick for the first couple of months, but then he turned it around. It was an absolute steal off the waiver wire if he picked him up. Well, now he's firmly a top 75 pick in fantasy, and I don't care. I'm taking him everywhere that I can. I'll just say again what I've been saying. He's got exactly what you want, a dominant fastball, one of the top in terms of induced vertical break, and he's got great secondary stuff to complement it. This guy is a workhorse built to be an ace, and he's going to be that. But what's even better is he actually doesn't need to be for the Orioles. Now that they got Corbin Burns, he won't have that pressure of being the number one guy going against the other team's number one. He gets to be the number two. And honestly, I think he can put up stats like a number one starting pitcher in fantasy, but you can get him at the cost on draft day of a number two pitcher. Even better. Now, the number one pitcher for the Cincinnati Reds, that doesn't sound too exciting. I get it. The park factor is terrible and all that. But Hunter Green, I mean, we know this guy's been a huge prospect for years. Injuries have slowed him down. And then last year, the whip was a little ugly. A 1.42 whip and an ERA kind of close to five. Not so good, especially combined with the injury risk. It's kind of hard to control things when you're consistently throwing it over 100 miles per hour. But let's keep in mind, this is a guy who's still just 24 years old, has yet to really throw a full season in the majors. This hopefully will be it. I'm still all in on green, not just because of his prospect pedigree and the velocity. That's all attractive, 
but I do believe he can get that whip down. He's going to do less hard contact because he isn't just going to try to overpower hitters. He's adding both a curb and a splitter to his repertoire this offseason. So far, signs have been good in the spring, and I think that he can continue to get those whiffs while also controlling the walks. I'm sure there will be some moments where he gets hit hard on certain starts, but I think those will be fewer and farther in between. He's also going to have some dominant outings. And for a guy who's available after pick 100 in most leagues, I'm going to take the plunge. All right, another pitcher that I find myself taking over and over again because I'm kind of surprised he's available so late is Shota Imanaga. Remember, he was also one of the other big free agent acquisitions from Japan, and this time it's the Cubs. Wrigley Field also not necessarily the best place for a pitcher, but Imanaga is somebody who, although I do feel he will give up some home runs, I don't think he's going to get lit up. This is somebody who's pretty good at inducing soft contact. Different from Yamamoto because not just being a lefty and throwing not nearly as hard, but he's someone who's going to rely more on trying to induce ground balls. I think he can do it, and I also think he will pile up enough strikeouts to be effective, but this is somebody who should be an innings eater. Again, it goes so underrated, you know, those guys who could just be out there every fifth day and go six or seven frames. Because Imanaga isn't as impressive in terms of velocity, he's not going to make nearly as many pitching ninja highlights as some other pitchers, but still, he's going to be quietly effective. This was a smart signing by the Cubs, and he's somebody who I feel at where he's being taken, kind of like the end of your rotation, is going to be a great value. And when we talk about starting pitchers, I can't stop drafting. I might as well just put Mariner staff. Every Mariner starting pitcher, I have some stake in. I'm interested in all of them at some point. I'm trying to mix it up, but I keep going back to Bryce Miller because he's just available so late. This is such an obvious breakout candidate. Talking about another pitching guru, Eno Saris has his Stuff Plus rankings. I already gave Bryce Miller a 116, pretty high, especially for such a young pitcher. And now Miller has been adding a splitter, another guy who's going for another really effective pitch. And again, I've read so much about this. Everything I've seen makes me buy in completely into Miller. He's just such an obvious pick at this rate. It's hard for me to believe that he's still available, almost around pick 200. Now when we get to the later rounds, there's so many pitchers with upside, but also question marks. Talent is where I'm going for, not guys who have the injury risk, mind you, but guys who just need to kind of take another step forward in development. I'm still in on Mackenzie Gore. I was in on Gore a little too much last year. He didn't take that step forward. Look, Washington isn't the best place for a pitcher to develop. We know this. But Gore is somebody who has been one of the top prospects for years. He just needs to get his control a little bit under control. I'm going to liken this sort of to a lesser version of Robbie Ray. If you remember a few years ago, he was a player who had great arm talent, was able to punch batters out at a high rate, but just couldn't stop walking batters. Now, Gore's walk rate isn't nearly as high as Ray's used to be, and his strikeout rate isn't as high either. But Gore is somebody who definitely can induce whiffs, and his walk rate needs to come down a little bit. If he can command his fastball a little bit better, he can definitely induce less hard contact, fewer home runs, and can punch batters out at a higher rate. And if you're waiting for a Giants pitcher, here it is. I've been on Kyle Harrison since late last year, and I still think he's worth a late round pick. It's funny because throughout spring, some people are wondering, is Harrison going to make the rotation or not? And now I see on roster resource, he's listed as the number two guy in that rotation. And that's partly out of necessity. Robbie Ray just talked about with the Giants. Yeah, they got him, but he's not going to be available to pitch maybe at all this year, if so, really late. Alex Cobb isn't going to be ready to start the season. Tristan Beck is hurt. Harrison's going to have to do some work for them. And this is a team that it looks like is going to have to have some bullpen games once in a while. New management will see if they operate the same way. But yeah, they're going to have to have guys like Mason Black out there. Ryan Walker might serve as an opener again sometimes. Rotation is a little scary right now if they don't add anything. So for right now, Harrison's going to be dependent on. That means he'll have a longer leash. He should be able to put up longer innings. This is a guy who, again, doesn't get by with elite velocity, so he doesn't get as much pub. 93 and a half on the fastball, which is fine because he still is able to induce whiffs, and he's got a slurve, which is pretty effective. 
and fun to say. And when I look for starting pitchers who could be reliable or also could have breakout seasons, I look, number one, for low walk rates. Number two, I look for a filthy secondary pitch that can be served as a punch-out pitch. But also, I like team environment and park factor as a tiebreaker. Harrison has that. He's not a guy who will necessarily have elite strikeout rates, but playing in San Francisco, that's something that works in his favor. Wouldn't surprise me to see him go 170-plus innings this year, rack up double-digit wins. Those are some of the starting pitchers I love this draft season. You want to know some pitchers who I think are just going way under the radar and could be great values in your draft? Check out this video.